In this video, I'm going to introduce some new terminology. The terms links and joints you've already heard. The links are the rigid parts of the robot that are responsible for transferring mechanical energy. Joints are the part of the robot that allow links to move relative to each other. Another word that I said in the first video but did not define for you is the term manipulator. Manipulator is another term for a robot arm. We use the term manipulator instead of arm for robots because a robot manipulator might not look anything like a, a human or animal arm. The manipulator consists of all of the robot links connected together by joints and ending in another new term, the end effector. The end effector of a robot is the part of the robot manipulator that does the work. If you're thinking of a robot manipulator as an arm, the end effector is the hand. But in a robot manipulator, the end effector might not be a gripper that simulates a, a hand. It might be another kind of a tool. For example, it might be a spray paint can if the robot manipulator is designed for painting. The length of links and the range of motion of joints in a robot manipulator determine the limits on the area or space that the robot end effector can reach. We call the area that the robot end effector can reach the robot's workspace. There's one more point of terminology that I need to talk about in this video, and this one is a little bit more difficult to explain. We'll look at some pictures of some robots in order to uh, learn this term. The term is degrees of freedom. Simply speaking, a robot's degrees of freedom is equal to the number of joints that the robot has. If the robot has three joints, then it has three degrees of freedom. If four joints, then the robot has four degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom that a robot manipulator has has consequences in terms of the robot workspace. I'm going to show you some videos and pictures of robots now to explain why this is true. This first video is showing a robot manipulator of a type that's called an articulated manipulator giving a guy a ride. Let's take a look at this video and I want you to try and identify the links and the joints and the end effector and the workspace of this robot and also see if you can determine the number of degrees of freedom that this robot has. Here's the video. The links in this robot are the parts that are um, rigid and, and not moving. The joints shown here, down here, right here at the elbow and back here, those joints are the parts that allow motion between the links. If you can count the number of joints very carefully here, we have one joint down there, we have one joint right there, so that's two, one right there that gives us three, and then on the end effector, here the end effector is the chair that the guy is sitting in. This chair can tilt up, it can rotate, and it can also tilt left and right. And so the end effector, the chair, has has three joints at the end. So the total number of degrees of freedom in this manipulator is six. One, two, 
three, and then four, five, and six are here at the chair. So in this case, the manipulator is this entire robot that looks like an arm in this case, and the end effector is the part that's at the end of the manipulator. In this case, the end effector is the chair. There are two different types of joints that a robot manipulator can have. The first type is called revolute joint. Revolute joints are joints that allow rotational motion of one link relative to another. In that video that we just watched, all of the joints in that manipulator are revolute joints, allowing one link to rotate relative to the other links. But there's another kind of a joint that we'll look at in another video in a moment. And those kinds of joints are called prismatic. Prismatic joints allow linear motion of one link relative to another. Let's take a look at some prismatic joints for a moment. If you have ever worked with a milling machine, then you've seen prismatic joints at work. I'm showing a video here of cast iron cutting. And what you'll notice is that this block, the workpiece, is moving uh, left and right in a linear fashion. Also, the spindle, you'll see, moves up and down, also linearly, not in a rotational fashion as we saw in the articulated manipulator that we looked at last. Any given robot manipulator can consist of any combination of rotational or prismatic joints. The first robot video we looked at was a robot that consisted only of rotational or revolute joints. And this milling machine that we're looking at right now consists of only prismatic joints. But a robot manipulator could consist of any combination of the two. When we want to design a robot manipulator or analyze a robot manipulator that we have in front of us, one of the first steps that we want to do is to draw a schematic diagram of the robot. A schematic of a robot manipulator is called a kinematic diagram, and it's sort of equivalent to the free body diagrams that you've drawn previously in other classes. The kinematic diagram shows the arrangement of revolute and prismatic joints in the robot. And we use it in order to do calculations for our robot. I'm now going to show you how to draw prismatic and revolute joints for a kinematic diagram of a robot manipulator. We'll start with the revolute joint. The drawing of a revolute joint shows the part of the joint that does not move and the part of the joint that does move. It looks sort of like a cylinder. Here I'm going to draw the part of a joint that does not move. And then coming out of the top of this cylinder, I'm going to draw a stick coming out. And we're going to imagine that this stick, if we reached out and grabbed it with our hand, we could rotate it like that while the cylinder part remains stationary. This is a revolute joint that's situated vertically, but we can also draw a revolute joint that's oriented horizontally. I'll show you one of those now. I'll draw the cylinder part that remains stationary, and then there will be another part coming off of that stationary part, and this stick part, we'll imagine that if we reached out and grabbed it with our hand, we would be able to rotate it up like that. I'll clean up this drawing a little bit to make it a little bit more clear. This drawing that I've shown is a drawing of a two degree of freedom manipulator.
It has two degrees of freedom because there are two joints, and both of these joints are revolute joints. Now I'm going to show you how to draw a prismatic joint. Similar to the revolute joint, the prismatic joint has a part that moves and a part that is stationary. While the revolute joint had a cylinder for the part that does not move, the prismatic joint will have a cube that represents the part that does not move, which I'm showing here. Then the part that does move um, will look like a square. I'll draw this square on the side of the cube that I intend the joint to move. In this case, I'm going to draw a joint moving to the right. And I can clean up my drawing a little bit here by removing these lines on the inside. And then I'll draw a stick coming out of the end of the plate. You can imagine that this cube stays stuck to the floor while the stick and the square slide out away from the cube. And this is how we draw a representation of a prismatic joint. If I was using this prismatic joint to represent the milling machine that I showed earlier, I could draw the work piece affixed to the end of this stick. And that would show me that I have a prismatic joint moving the work piece left and right. This picture shows a one degree of freedom robot manipulator because it has one joint. And this one degree of freedom manipulator consists of only one prismatic joint. In the next video, we're going to be looking at how many joints we would expect a robot manipulator to have and why. In this video, we already looked at the articulated manipulator and we counted up that it had six joints or six degrees of freedom. There is a reason why many robot manipulators have six degrees of freedom and many other manipulators have three degrees of freedom. In the next video, we'll find out why this is. Following that, we'll look at some standard types of manipulators and we'll practice drawing some more kinematic diagrams of standard manipulators.